All right, Shalom. This is your brother, Mati Zabath. First and foremost, I want to give all praise, glory, and honor to Yahweh, Bahashem, Yahweh Shai, Bahashem, Dash. Double honors to the apostles and elders of GMS, better known as Great Millstone, who rule well. And as always, we give peace and salutations unto the hopeful elect. And um, this is going to be a response going back, you know, to the comment board by this uh, brother who goes by the name of Lennox Williams, who left up um, a comment pertaining to my video, um, not a people, the Gentiles, a.k.a. our Israelite foreigners. And um, the brother said, brother, it's a deep teaching. Uh, however, I must disagree. Romans 11 is talking about actual Gentiles in this context, meaning non-bloodline Israelite, which is off. And it's not talking about that, but we'll get it. He goes on to say the scripture even make a clear distinction in Romans 11, 21, referring to bloodline in this context as natural branches. OK, which he's correct is referring to the Jews, which simply mean they are of the flesh, which were broken off. And what will be grafted in is wild by nature, meaning not Israelite by blood or by father's lineage, which is off. That's not what it's talking about. Then he goes on to say, therefore, it's pretty clear, my brother, but just revisit the scriptures and keep searching. Well, the issue that we have here is um, you don't understand uh, prophecy, number one. And number two, um, your um, level of understanding pertaining to the natural branches versus the, the branches that were wild by nature is off. All right. So let's actually go and revisit that. All right. This is Romans chapter 11, and I'm going to start at verse, uh, you know what, we'll start at verse 19. It says, in the KJV, actually, you know what, we're reading in the uh, CSB to make the English more, you know, clear. It says, then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. True enough, they were broken off because of unbelief, but you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but be aware, but beware. Salakia, verse 21, because if the Most High did not spare the natural branches, which represents uh, the Jews, the actual circumcision, right? He will not spare you either. OK, now in this reference, Paul is speaking to those Israelite foreigners, OK, who were called Gentiles. And we're going to prove it. Verse 22, it says, therefore, consider the Most High's kindness and severity severity toward uh toward those who have fallen but the most high's kindness towards you if you remain in his kindness otherwise you too will be cut off so paul is saying like you know don't boast take heed because even though the heavenly father uh has cut off you know those particular jews you know due to their unbelief if you pretty much stand okay in unbelief as well all right then the same thing is going to happen to you, which he's going to expound upon that in the very next verse, verse 23. And even they, if they do not remain in unbelief, will be grafted in because the most high has the power to graft them in again. Let me read that part again, because this this went over your head, Lennox. And even they, if they do not remain in unbelief, because you have certain Jews that, you know, uh, didn't believe on Yahweh Shai or the gospel will be grafted in because the most high has the power to graft them in again what does it mean to graft them in again well who was a, who was part of that first covenant the israelites and i brought out in the video okay when you get psalms 147 it clearly tells you he showeth his word unto jacob verse 19 his statues and his judgments unto israel he have not dealt so with any nation, and as for his judgments, they have not known them. Praise ye the Lord. Read it in the CSB. He declares his word to Jacob, his statutes and his judgments to Israel. He has not done this for every nation. They do not know his judgments. So how can every nation outside of Israel, Lennox Williams, be grafted in again to something that they were not once a part of? Right. That's why when you read the book of Amos, it also tells you Amos chapter three verse one and two in a csb it says listen to this message that the lord has spoken against you israelites against the entire clan that i brought from the land of egypt i have known only you out of all the clans of the earth meaning all the nations of the earth 
Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. So once again, even the prophet Amos is making the establishment that the Lord was only dealing with Israel. He wasn't dealing with the other nations. And this is why you have to go through the precepts to put the puzzle pieces together. So let's go back to Romans. OK. Real quick, because there's a lot that we have to address and cover. Let's read it again. Verse 23. And even they, if they do not remain in unbelief, will be grafted in because the Most High has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from your native wild olive tree and against nature were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Now, who was the original olive tree? Let's get it. When you type in olive tree, okay, and I believe it's in the book of Jeremiah. Yep, Jeremiah chapter 11, okay? And to make it easy, when you go up to the top of the chapter, all right. Verse one, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, hear ye the words of this covenant and speak unto the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So both northern kingdom, which represented Jerusalem and southern kingdom, which represented um, Judah, Benjamin and Levi. Right. So that's who we know the context is. in. when you drop down later on in this chapter, verse 16, let's read it. KJV. It says, the Lord Yahweh will call thy name. Okay, who's thy name? All right, Israel, a green olive tree, fair and of goodly fruit, with the noise of a great tumult, he hath kindled fire upon it, and the branches of it are broken. For the Lord of hosts that planted thee hath pronounced evil against thee, for the evil of the house of Israel and of the house of Judah, which they have done against themselves to provoke me to anger and offering incense unto Baal. So when you go into the history, when you go to first Kings, OK, who was the first um, kingdom to be split? Let's give first Kings, the 17th chapter. When you go into first Kings, chapter 17, OK, or oh, Salakia, I think it's second Kings, the 17th chapter, Salakia. Yep. When you go into Second Kings, and um, let's see here, we'll start at verse. Let's see here, just to give you, uh, we'll start at verse. We'll start at verse eighteen. It says, therefore, the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah only. Also, Judah kept not the commandments of the Lord, their power, but walked in the statues of Israel, which they made. And the Lord, Yahweh rejected all the seed of Israel and afflicted them and delivered them into the hand of the spoilers until he had cast them out of his sight. For he rent Israel from the house of David. And they made uh, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, king and Jeroboam drave Israel from following the Lord and made them sin a great sin for the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did. They uh, departed not from them until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight, as he has said by all his servants, the prophets. So was Israel carried away out of their own land to Assyria unto this day. So the northern kingdom was the first to depart. That was the first to get cast out. Then later on, the southern kingdom was cast out. This is when both northern and southern kingdom were split because the last time all 12 tribes were together was under the rule of King Solomon. OK. And a lot of you Christians don't understand that. And it seems like I don't know, you know, I don't want to put words in your mouth, Linux. I, you probably understand that. You probably know that history. You probably don't. I don't know. OK, but I just have to throw that out. Um, just over as a general aspect, because you got people that don't understand that history. So now going back to Romans, okay, Romans 11, and let's read, keep, uh, let's keep reading down verse 24. Here's the controversy. 
in a CSB. It says, for if you were cut off from your native wild olive tree and against nature were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Verse 25. I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery, right? Because this is a mystery. That's why everybody don't get it, such as yourself, Lennox. Brothers and sisters, which were, which in this context, who is Paul talking to? The letter that's written in Romans is talking to the Israelites. And what's the proof of that? Romans, the ninth chapter. It says, so that you will not be conceited. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. But here's the whole um, here's the whole conclusion to the whole matter, Lennox. Verse 26. And in this way, all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godliness away from Jacob. Where's that at? Let's go to the Old Testament, Isaiah, the 59th chapter. Starting at verse 19 in the CSB, they will fear the name of Yahweh in the west and his glory in the east, for he will come like a rushing stream driven by the wind of the Lord. Why? Because all Israel is scattered from the west to the east across the four corners of the earth. But here's the point. Verse 20. The Redeemer will come to Zion. Who is Zion? Israel. And to those in Jacob who turn from transgression, starting with the elect. This is the Lord's declaration. As for me, this is my covenant with them, not with everyone, Lennox, the other nations, the natural Gentiles, as, as you claim in your comment, the non blood lie Israelites. No, he says, as for me, this is my covenant with them. Zion says the Lord, my spirit who is on you and my words that I have put in your mouth will not depart from your mouth or from the mouths of your children, meaning descendants. Or from the mouths of your children's children from now on and forever, says the Lord. Okay, because when you get Romans, the ninth chapter, Lennox, let's start at verse three. All right, I'll read it in the CSB. It says, for I could wish that myself were cursed and cut off from Hamashiach for the benefit of my brothers and sisters, which we read in Romans 11. Who is he talking to? Keep reading. My own flesh and blood. They are Israelites. Paul wasn't speaking to um, non-Israelites that were, um, you know, mentioning of the wild olive branch. No, those wild olive branch were Israelite foreigners that were not keeping the laws. OK, and we want to get that. But it goes on to say, verse four, they are Israelites and to them belong the adoption. What was the adoption? Lennox, go to Galatians. It's the book of Galatians. OK. Verse four, CSB, when the time came to completion, the Most High sent his son born of a woman born under the law to redeem those under the law. Who did Yahweh Shai come back for? Lennox Williams. He came back for the house of Israel because Israel was the only nation that was under the law. Lennox. OK, the law was the heritage of the nation of Israel. And it tells you that. Let's prove that. Scripture says prove all things. Right. So let's grab Sirach, the 17th chapter. Actually, this is a good chapter. I might start at verse. Um, actually, let me type it in. It might be another precept. Yep, I had it right. All right, let's start at verse. Uh, let's see here. Now. When you start at actually, if you start at the top, it says the Lord created man of the earth and turned him into it again, which this is going into Adam. He gave them few days in a short time and power also over the things therein. He endued them with strength by themselves and made them according to his image. 
OK, and this is go. This goes back to Genesis, the second chapter. All right. Adam was made in the image of uh, Yahweh Bashem Yahushad. Verse four says, and put the fear of man upon all flesh and gave him dominion over the beasts and the fowls. They received the use of the five operations of the Lord. And in the sixth place, he imparted them understanding. And in the seventh speech and an interpreter of the cogitations thereof, counsel and a tongue and eyes and ears and a heart gave he them to understand. Withal, he filled them with the knowledge of understanding and showed them good and evil. He set his eye upon their hearts that he may show them the greatness of his works. He gave them to glory in his marvelous acts forever that they might declare his works with understanding. Verse 10, and the elect shall praise his holy name. Who's the elect? The elect is talking about Israel. How can we prove that? Let's get Isaiah. Chapter 45 and verse 4. Okay. In the KJV, for Jacob, my servant's sake, in Israel, mine elect. I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. You see, Israel is that elect. So let's go back. Verse 11. Besides this, he gave them knowledge and the law of life for inheritance. Who was given a law? Go back to Psalms 147, 19 and 20. He made an everlasting covenant with them and showed them his judgments, but he didn't do it to every other nation. OK, so I just wanted to bring that part out. So now. We have to understand because your take on Romans 11 and 21. All right. Now that we went because all of that was just the intro. Now let's get down to the nitty gritty of it. Let's read 21 again. KJV for if the most high spare, not the natural branches. Take heed lest he also spare not thee. So you're saying that in this context, he's talking about non-blood Israelites. Well, we have to go back to see how the heavenly father feels about the other nations. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 40 and start at verse 15 through verse 17. KJV, it says, behold, the nations. Now, when you look up that word nations, Let's see who is actually talking about. Strong's age, 1471. Goy. Goy. Right. So Goy, which means what? Nation, people, nation, usually of non-Hebrew people. OK, now it says here of descendants of Abraham. OK, of Israel, of swarm of locusts or other animals. OK. Goy simply means nation, but when you put the yum at the end, goy yum, it means nations, make it plural. Now, here's the point. When you get the KJV translate Strong's H1471 in the following manner. So anytime you see the word nation 374 times, that's who it's referring to. If you see the word heathen 143 times, that's the context it's referring to. If you see the word Gentiles in the Old Testament 30 times, it's going back to that word goyum. OK, now it's referring to in the strong definition, Gentile heathen. OK, because in the context, this is really referring to the uh, the actual natural heathens. OK, now who are considered the Gentiles? Well, you can grab that. Let's get first Edris chapter eight and verse sixty nine. It says the nation of Israel, the princes. The priests and the Levites have not put away from them the strange people of the land, nor the pollutions of the Gentiles, to which are of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perishites, the Jebusites and the Moabites, the Egyptians and Edomites. Those will be considered your Gentiles as well as the your Japhetic nations. OK. The Ammonites, really all the nations that are listed in the book of. Uh, let's grab this here. Psalms. So that you can get a better understanding. These are considered all the heathen nations. When you get the book of Psalms, the 83rd chapter. OK, let's read it. It says, verse two, for lo, thy enemies make a tumult and they that hate thee have lifted up thy head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be no more remembrance. For they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee. Against who? 
Yahweh by Shemuel Rashad in the nation of Israel. Now pay attention, Lennox. Verse 6 and 7 is going to tell you who these nations are. The tabernacles of Edom, first on the list, and the Ishmaelites the, of Moab and of Hagarines, Gabal, Ammon, Amalek, the Philistines with the inhabitants of Tyre. And Ashur also is joined with them. They have hope, uh, hope in the children of Lot, Salah. So these list of nations are considered the enemies. So how can salvation be given to them when they are considered an enemy? This is why when you go to the book of Luke, which is this is going to cut you. All right, let's get rid of that and go back in. When you go to the New Testament and you get the book of Luke, what was Zechariah's uh, prophecy? Starting at verse 68, right? We'll read it in the CSB. It says, blessed is the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited and provided redemption for his people. Not for everybody, Lennox Williams, for his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David, just as he spoke, uh, spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets in ancient times. It says 71 salvation from our enemies and from the hand of those who hate us, Lennox Williams. So why is Zechariah prophesying in the New Testament that redemption was only coming to the nation of Israel? to redeem them from their enemies. Who was their enemies? We just read it in Psalms, the 83rd chapter. So if those nations listed in Psalms 83 are considered the enemies of Yahweh by Shemiah Rashai, what makes you think according to the New Testament, okay, that those nations under the context of the wild grafted olive tree can be grafted into salvation if they are deemed as the enemies? Make it make sense. It doesn't make any sense. So let's go back to Isaiah, the 45th cha Salaki, the 40th chapter, and let's read about these other nations. Okay. We're going to read it in the CSB. Verse 15. Look, the nations are like a drop in a bucket. They are considered as a speck of dust on the scales. He lifts up the islands like fine dust. Lebanon cedars are not enough for fuel. Or its animals enough for a burnt offering. Here's the point. Verse 17. All the nations are as nothing. Lennox Williams before him. They are considered by him as empty. Nothingness. So all the other nations. Okay. They don't mean a damn thing to the heavenly father. Okay. Let's get it in the Apocrypha. All what you're going to understand Lennox is. None of the scriptures contradict each other because all the prophets were on one accord. This is uh second address chapter six. We're going to start at verse 54. It says, and after these Adam also whom thou madest Lord of all thy creatures of him come we all and the people also whom thou hast chosen. All this have I spoken before thee, O Lord, because thou madest the world for our sakes the world was made for the uh, for Israelites, okay, for the sake of Israel, okay. You can also get that in Second Edges, the seventh chapter, verse fifty six. As for the other people, Lennox Williams, which also come of Adam, thou hast said that they are nothing but be like unto spittle. You know what spittle is, Lennox Williams? It's when you spit, and has likened the abundance of them unto a drop that falleth from a vessel. And now, O oh Lord, behold, these heathen, these natural Gentile nations, which have ever been reputed as nothing, Lennox Williams, have begun to be lords over us and to devour us. You see that? And that's what's happening right now today, Mr. Lennox Williams. All 12 tribes are under the next of all these other heathen nations, mainly the top heathen nation being the, uh, the Edomites. It says, verse 58, but we, thy people, whom thou ca has called thy firstborn, thy only begotten and thy fervent lover are given into their hands. Why? Due to our disobedience. OK. It says, if the world now be made for our sakes, why do we not possess an inheritance with the world? How long shall this endure? You see. 
That's why it tells you in Baruch, Lennox Williams, let's grab that. I believe it's Baruch chapter three. Baruch chapter three and eight, it says, behold, we are yet this day in our captivity where thou hast scattered us for a reproach and a curse and to be subject to payments according to all the iniquities of our fathers, which departed from the Lord, our power. You see, so we are still this day in the necks of our enemies. That's why uh, Zechariah prophesied saying the Lord has redeemed us from our enemies. Because when Ezra says that they, you know, they, you know, tried to devour us when you get Jeremiah, because what was the prophecy? Jeremiah 30 and 16. Let's highlight that in red. It says, therefore, all they that devour thee. So all these nations, Lennox Williams, that devoured us shall be devoured and all thine adversaries. Every one of them shall do shall, what's going to happen to them, Lennox. They shall go into captivity and they that spoil thee. So everybody that spoiled the Israelites shall be spoiled and all they that pray upon thee. will I give for a prey for I will restore health unto thee talking about the Israelites and I will heal thee of thy wounds, said the Lord, because they called thee an outcast. OK, we were called heathens. We were called Gentiles saying this is Zion whom no man seek it after. Now, who called us a heathen? When you look up like in, uh, let's see here. Yeah, I misspelled the wrong. Yep, Ezekiel 25. Watch this, Ezekiel 25 and 8. Thus said the Lord Yahweh, because that Moab and Seir, which are your Edomites, do say, behold, the house of Judah is like unto all the heathen. They called us heathen. We were known as Gentiles. Why? Because we have fallen away from our power by being disobedient. And when we were scattered into those other nations, we became like the Gentiles. OK, that's what you're not understanding. These other nations ain't got no part in the inheritance. So now that, you know, we broke that down. Now we have to get some understanding. OK, on the translation, because anytime Lennox Williams, you go into the New Testament and you want to, you know, go into words like Gentiles. OK, or Salakia, the word Gentile or uh you know, Greek. OK, all of these is what's called a stumbling block. OK, you're unlearned. You don't have the wisdom, knowledge and understanding. So this is the book of Sirach, better known as Ecclesiasticus. OK, and we're going to start here at the top. Where it says my grandfather, Yahweh when he had much given himself to the reading of the law, meaning the Holy Scriptures, and the prophets and the other books of our fathers and had gotten therein good judgment was drawn on also himself to write something pertaining to learning and wisdom to the intent that those which are desirous to learn and are addicted to these things might profit much more in living according to the law. But here's the point. It says, wherefore, let me entreat you to read it with favor and attention and to pardon us wherein we may seem to come short of some words which we have labored to interpret for the same things uttered in Hebrew and translated into another tongue, Linus Williams, have not the same force in them. And not only these things, but the law itself and the prophets and the rest of the books have no small difference when they are spoken in their own language. Now, why did I bring this out? Because when every time we get to the New Testament, and y'all want to bring up words like Gentiles and the and the grafting in of the wild olive tree. You don't understand what mainly the word Gentile. You don't understand the etymology of what that word really means. So because you really don't have no understanding. All right. This is a PDF from the scribe website dealing with the uh, etymology of the word Gentile. At the top, it says 
throughout our Bible, the Greek word ethnos is translated as Gentile. Keep in mind, key word translated as Gentile or as nation, singular, not plural, Lennox Williams. While dogma in Christianity today interprets the word Gentile as non-Jew, which is what you tried to do, leading into your own understanding, pretending to Romans 11 and 21, talking about non-blood Israelites, continue to read. It says, that is not what it means in the Bible. For writers of the Greek Old Testament, Septuagint and of the New Testament, ethnots meant ethnic group or race. It was most often a reference to our ethnic group, personal pronoun, our people of Israel, the lost sheep whom Yahawashai came to redeem. And we read that in Galatians, the fourth chapter. It was sometimes used to refer to other ethnic groups. Whenever you come to the word Gentile or nation in the Bible, try replacing those words with our ethnic group. The context will make it clear if it refers to other ethnic groups. Mostly Yahawashai and New Testament writers use the word to mean their own specific ethnic group. The Israelites never did they mean all who are not Israelites. Lennox Williams, it says the Greek lexicons and Greek word studies and the Latin dictionary and Skeet's dictionary of etymology clearly define the word Gentile and ethnos as race, a tribe, a clan. OK, drop down. It says never does any objective scholar attempt to pervert. OK, to mean all those who are not of the Jewish race, which is what you're trying to do, Lennox Williams. You're trying to fit salvation for all other nations where clearly the Heavenly Father was never dealing with all the other nations. It says that is a meaning exactly opposite from its true meaning. Yet that is the generally accepted meaning, okay, of the word Gentile by modern Christianity. It is also in recent years that this perverted meaning has become commonplaces because that's all it means. They have converted the word Gentile to try to uh, in, uh, to put in place universal salvation when indeed universal salvation is foreign to the scriptures. It says at the time of the 1611 King James translation, the word Gentile meant race, tribe, clan. So the word Gentile was properly uh, was properly used for that 1611 translation. But now that the meaning has been radically changed, it is not a proper word for translations today. That's the reason why y'all stumble. OK, it says the perverted coloration of this word's definition has had a tremendous influence on the character of Christianity in the world today. Instead of recognizing Yahweh Shai's statements that he came for none except the lost sheep of the house of Israel, a specific ethnic racial group, which you can get that in Matthew 15 and 24, also Matthew 18 and 11. It says the church now teaches that Yahweh Shai came for all others also. This misunderstanding of Gentile is so pervasive and overriding that the Christians willingly overlook Yahweh Shai clear and explicit statements regarding the one specific ethnic group for whom he came. The lost sheep of the house of Israel, Christians offer the New Testament, new covenant to all peoples of the world by ignoring the specific words of the Most High in Hebrews 8 and 8. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And that's plain. But see, what happens is, OK, you have a lot of people, Lennox Williams. I'm not talking about you, but I'm just talking about others in general, that anytime we bring out actual factual evidence like this, then they'll want to try to exert their own vain opinion and say, well, no, it's a spiritual Israel. Now, there's no such thing as a spiritual Israel. It's about the bloodline, the seed of Israel. It says it is explicit 
that the new covenant belongs to the descendants of Jacob, not to everyone. In other words, what? Everybody is not written in that salvation. Okay. It says Christians charge forth to save the world, ignoring the fact that Yahweh Shai told his disciples he wouldn't speak clearly to the general public because they might understand and repent and be forgiven. It's no wonder that the Most High must hide the higher truths from Christians. They aren't willing to heed Yahweh Shai's explicit instructions. Old Testament history is a story of one specific ethnic group. Let me read that part again. Old Testament history is a story of one specific ethnic group, which is, if you understand the narrative, it's talking about the Israelites. It says a race of people whom the Most High nourished and guided and protected with obvious lack of concern for any neighboring races, which we read in Isaiah 40 verses 15 and 17 and Second Edra 6 verses 54 all the way down to 59. The other nations are considered nothing. You see, it says, accept his stern warnings against mixing with them, which is another thing. How can he, why would the heavenly father throughout the old Testament get on us about being around the other heathen nations, not mixing in, not inter, um, intermarrying with them because they would turn our hearts against him only to turn around in the New Testament, Lennox William, and to say, now blood Israelites can take part into it now. Oh, uh, never mind what I said in the Old Testament. OK, even though it tells you in Malachi three and six, the most high changes not. But never mind what I said in the Old Testament. I'm going to open up salvation to everyone. No. And this is why I said to you, it's no disrespect to you, Brother Lennox Williams, because I know you don't have the full truth. You're unlearned. You haven't went deep into the scriptures. You haven't pulled up the root etymology of words to get a proper understanding of what the uh, precepts is actually talking about. It says he stated explicitly that he came for none except this specific group. There is no inconsistency or uh, ambiguity regarding this until now that we have the modern definition of Gentile as all others than Jews, the very opposite from its true meaning. It says scholars have done us a Salakia. They cut that part off. But if I can, I'll see if I can leave this PDF form because they go in and they tell the truth. Now, <clears throat> what you got to understand, okay, what you have to understand <clears throat> when you get Romans, okay, this whole chapter is predicated on all Israel, okay, coming together, starting with the elect, okay, that's why it tells you Romans 11 and 7. It says, what then Israel have not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election have to obtain it and the rest were blinded. So through the elect, all Israel will be saved. OK, that's why it tells you. In Galatians, because <clears throat> th this is another cut, let's get Galatians chapter three and verse 16 dealing with Abraham. KJV now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Okay. And who was that promise given down to Lennox Williams from Abraham to Isaac, to Jacob and from Jacob to his 12 sons. He saith not into seeds plural as in, as of many. Why? Because Lennox Abraham had eight sons. The first of them was Ishmael. Ishmael wasn't uh, given a promise. He was given a blessing, <clears throat> but as we read in Psalms 83, Lennox, Ishmael is under that list as an enemy that the heavenly father is going to put under subjective. He's going to put into captivity. OK, because you have something that was called the sub-Saharan slave trade that the Arabs took part in. OK. Then you had Keturah, Abraham's uh, second wife after Sarah. OK, or third wife because he had Hagar. Right. Abraham has six sons with uh, Keturah. They're not under the covenant. They're not under the promises. They're not under salvation. So that's why it says he saith not 
into seeds because what? Abraham had eight sons in total. But as of one Lennox William, and who was that one? It was referring to Isaac and to thy seed, which is Hamashiach. All right. That's what it was talking about. So you have to understand that it wasn't speaking about non-blood Israelites because let's go to John. We go, I'm going to end it on these two and then I'm going to play a video in the post-production. Let's get John chapter 7, okay, in verse 35. Reading the KJV. It says, Then said the Jews among themselves, Whither will he go that we shall not find him? Will he go unto the dispersed among the Gentiles? Okay, Lennox Williams, among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles who was dispersed among the Gentiles. Who was Yahweh Shai? All right. Going to who did it? Uh, who did they think Yahweh Shai was going to go and speak to? Let's get Deuteronomy chapter four. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Verse 27. What was the prophecy? And the Lord shall scatter you among the nations. When you look at that word nations, it goes back to the uh, Hebrew word goyim. And ye shall be left few in number among the heathen, among, key word, among, whither the Lord shall lead you. <clears throat> so that was a prophecy. So going back to John, okay, let's break that verse down. John chapter 7, verse 35, then said the Jews among themselves, whither will he go that we should not find him? Will he go unto the dispersed? among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles. So he's calling this dispersed group Gentiles. Let's look up the word disperse to find out Lennox Williams, if they were non-blood Israelites or were they indeed Israelites that were called Gentiles. Strong's G 1290 diaspora. Diaspora. It says here a scattering dispersion of Israelites. You see that dispersed among foreign nations. And we just read that in Deuteronomy 4 and 27, which was an end time prophecy. So like not an end time prophecy. It was a prophecy that had already happened. We are still scattered this day. Of the Christians scattered abroad among the Gentiles. Now, this is a stumbling block because who were the who were the Christians that it was talking about? We're going to get that in Acts, the 11th chapter. But continuing on Strong's definition, it says dispersion, i.e. specially and concretely the converted Israelite Lennox Williams resident in Gentile countries, which are scattered abroad. This is who Paul's epistles were to. Now, let's go back and deal with. With who were the Christians scattered abroad? Because when you understand who was scattered abroad, okay, which it t clearly tells you the Israelite, the Israelites were considered Christians, not anybody who believes. Let's prove that. Who were the first Christians that came on the scene? Acts 11, okay, and verse 26. It says, and when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch because who were the disciples preaching to or matter of fact let's go even further who were the disciples all of the disciples Lennox Williams were Israelites and they were preaching to only Israelites because only Israelites can call upon Yahweh Bashim Shai. Okay? So the first Christians were the disciples because the disciples were Israelites. That's why it tells you, going back to John, the seventh chapter, okay, the Christians that were scattered among the actual uh, Gentile nations. All right? Of the Christians scattered abroad among the Gentiles who were who was scattered abroad. It just it just told you Israelites. This is not talking about anybody who believes that's the problem. Y'all don't know how to look up words. 
So now let's go ahead. Let's get first Peter because even Peter said it. First Peter one and one Peter and an apostle of Yahweh Shai Hamashiach to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, elect according to foreknowledge, meaning they are the first fruits. They were chosen before the foundation of the world. Now, my question, Lennox Williams, who are the strangers scattered that this uh, letter was written to? Let's go into that word. OK, scattered. And once again, the same word, diaspora, in John 7 and 35. Once again, those strangers are talking about the Israelite foreigners. These are your Gentile, uh, your, your actual Gentiles that it was talking about. That's why even James' letter, what did James say? James 1 and 1. A serv James, a servant of the Most High and of the Lord, Yahweh Shah Mashiach, to the 12 tribes, which are scattered abroad. You see that, Lennox Williams? You can't get around it. You can't get around it. Right? Now, let's really, let's really end this. Let's get John chapter 11. Right? John chapter 11. And um, we'll start at verse 47. And I'm going to read this in the C, the CSB. It says, so the Salakia, it says. So the chief priest and the Pharisees convened uh, the uh, Sanhedrin and were saying, what are we going to do since this man is doing many signs? If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. All right, because they had made a treaty, you know, with the Romans. All right. Talking about the uh, the Jews. Verse 49. One of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. Keep in mind, Lennox Williams, this is the high priest of the Jews. Said to them, you know nothing at all. Verse 50. You're not considering that it is to your advantage that one man shall die for the people. OK, you hear that, Lennox Williams, die for the people rather than the whole nation perish. Now, Lennox Williams, keep in mind at the end of that verse. OK, it's singular, not plural. Notice it said that whole nation not perish or rather than the whole nation perish. So once again, this is letting you know this is talking about a specific ethnic group of people. It didn't say rather than the whole nations perish, those who believe from the from the Jew and the non uh, is uh, the non, uh, as you say, those non Israelites that are not a part of that. In other words, an actual Gentile. No, it said rather than the whole nation, personal pronoun, singular. Verse 51. He did not say this on his own, but being high priest that year, he prophesied, Lennox Williams, prophesied. What does it mean to prophesy? To say beforehand a thing that's going to come to pass. The high priest Caiaphas prophesied that Yahweh Shai was going to die for the nation. Personal pronoun, singular, once again, not plural. And not for the nation only, you ready, Lennox Williams, but also to unite the scattered children of God. Who is considered the scattered children? We already went into it. It's the Israelites. This is in the New Testament. This is what all, this is what the entire New Testament is about. It is not about salvation for all others as well to be grafted in. Once again, you are not listening. How can you be grafted into something, Lennox Williams, that you were never a part of? You need to answer that. And stop leaning into your own understanding, because that is what you're doing. That's why you cannot understand the breakdown of Romans, the 11th chapter. That's why Paul said it is a mystery. 
Okay, let's get 2 Peter 3, and, uh, 15 and 16. Okay. <clears throat> Read it in the CSB. Also regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our dear brother Paul has written to you according to wisdom given to him. Verse 16. He speaks about these things in all his letters. There are some matters that are hard to understand. And one of those matters, Lennox Williams, is understanding Romans, the 11th chapter, and who were those Gentiles that was being grafted in. It says the untaught and unstable will twist them to their own destruction, as they also do with the rest of the scriptures. That's you, Lennox Williams. You don't understand the, the epistles of Paul. Paul understood what his mission was and who he was preaching to. So anytime y'all come up on a comment board talking about some, you know, oh, hey, you know, I respectfully disagree, even though that was a real deep breakdown, brother. But you're wrong because those actual people that were being grafted in were the actual other nations. No, they weren't. No, they were not. And there is nothing that you can do to prove all the precepts and that PDF form that I brought out. You can't, <laughs> there's nothing that you can do to the, to uh, refute that. So rather than you telling me, I need to go back and study. No, this is what you need to do. Let's get second Peter Salaki. Let's get second Timothy two and verse 15 study to show thyself approved unto the most high, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You have to break it down. So. Call Halalim Le Yahweh Bashim Yahushah Bashim Rakakwadash. Stay tuned and watch the post reduction, all right, video that I have uh, loaded up that's going to bring all of this home. Shalom. And of course, we're talking about the Israelite kings of the houses of Judah, you know, uh, Zerah and Pharez. Well, absolutely. We're yes. talking about the dispersion of Israel. Right. And right. Paul knew that the nations that he went to were all dispersed Israelites. Yes. And his letters yeah. prove it over again and again. Yes, so that the universalists who want to interpret this phrase, the way it has been translated, uh, and uh, you could say it like this, to bear my name before the nations, which, uh, which Gentiles they assume means not Israelites. Right. <laughs> okay. And kings, which is another separate group, whoever they might be, and the children of Israel, as if the first two were different from the, uh, from the latter. Right, but the, the grammatical construction is called a hendiatrisin, and it means one by means of three. It means that all three of these entities being mentioned are actually the same. The okay. nations and the kings of the sons of Israel is the literal reading. Yes, okay, very good. Well, uh, let me finish with verse 16. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. So, so uh, for the Paul bashers, these two verses... 15 and 16 are very succinctly uh, declaring that Paul is a chosen vessel. Absolutely. The Paul bashers are doing us a great disservice. Yes. Because these verses not only do that, they prove that Christianity is for only right. the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Right. Because of the bad translation, the universalists have to chosen to universalize it, and the Paul bashers agree with them not understanding the grammar here. Well, the Paul, Bashers, the Paul Bashers' biggest mistake is simply taking for granted yeah. that the mainstream translators translated all this properly. <laughs> right, right, absolutely. absolutely. And they botched it at every turn. Yeah, they universalized it, they twisted it and perverted it at every turn, right. and, and this is one of the primary verses. Yes, yes, very good. So uh, let me just, uh, one more question before we close this evening. Uh, do you think that this, uh, this false translation or this mistranslation here is deliberate or are, are the King James, uh, it appears to me, uh, this is the conclusion that I've come to for a lot of these really bad translations, is that these translations from the Greek in the New Testament, especially the writings of Paul, uh, it, it's, it sounds to me like these King James translators didn't know Greek that well. It, it seems to be on many occasions that they did not know Greek that well. Okay. And, okay. and that men before them made errors. Yes. But the biggest error, the biggest sin, 
are the translators of, of recent times yes. who should know better, <laughs> who after 200 years, yes. you, you know, the English, uh, uh, the English, the scholarship that the Englishman has brought us, has brought to the world, is simply amazing. Right. The work that they did in the Victorian age and, and the age of the empire, all right, the work that they did in archaeology and in language studies, and, and I do the best that I can to follow that legacy. Right. And that is why I use all um, classical English in, in the sense of, you know, Victorian English references. Yes. That's why I use the Liddell and Scott lexicon. Right. I don't use any of the modern trash because a lot of that's watered down and politically corrected. Right. And that's why I read the Loeb Library um, Greek classics because they were all translated in like the 1920s and 30s uh -huh. at, at the peak of, of English scholarship. Okay. Most of them were translated by English scholars. Right, right. And so we can also detect in uh, the New Testament a lot of Catholic influence as well. Okay. Right, and and in the 1600s, when the translators did translate, if if indeed they they knew any Greek, they they had to know some, right? Right. They 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 had to universalize. They had to accept universalized interpretations. Yes. Because they did not. They knew they belonged in Christianity, but they did not know how. Right. They did, they did not have the the archaeology. And the, and the the Greek scholarship and the scholarship in the classics yeah. that, that later generations had. Yeah, they did not understand that they were Israelites, and the Jews were making the claim that they were Israel, and so that who are we? <laughs> right, it's probably just, what they were thinking. They just took for granted the Jewish definitions of a lot of terms, like right. Gentiles. Right, right. But Jerome, when he translated the Vulgate, you know, there are other words besides Gentilis that he could have used. Okay. But a gentilis indicates somebody of the same race. Yes. Not necessarily of the same nation, but of the same race. Of the same race, exactly. And there are other words in Latin that denote people of other countries yes. that don't make that distinction, okay. that don't yes. have that connotation. Right. And the whole world has been fooled by the Jewish redefinition of the word Gentile to mean non-Jew. And it never did. And it never did. That's right. And, and Paul, you know, the commission here to Paul is to go and bring the name of Christ before both yes. the nations and kings of the sons of Israel. Uh-huh. Right. And Paul's epistles prove over and over again, and, and, and he does it to the Romans, <laughs> and he does it to the Corinthians, that they are the dispersed children of Israel. Right. So and if Paul was going to pervert Christianity, we'd have... An epistle of Paul to the Ethiopians, an <laughs> right. epistle of Paul to the Egyptians, the black an Hebrews. epistle of Paul to the to the Hutus and the Tutsis. Right. We don't have that. There's no epistle the of Paul right. to the Arabs. There's right. no epistle of Paul to the Babylonians. Exactly. There's no epistle of Paul to the Edomites. Yeah, right. Paul right. could have very easily perverted Christianity. Right. And it, the it, Paul it, bashers are just idiots for not seeing that. And, of course, in other books, uh, Paul definitely says that the Edomites are vessels fit for destruction. Of destruction, yeah. right. He does not include them among the Israelites. And, and he, he doesn't include any nation that's non-Israelite. Right. And Every he, one of those people Paul wrote an epistle to were dispersed Israelites. Right, right. And he excludes the uh, descendants of Ishmael, which is your today's Arabs, right? Absolutely. He, he excludes, he excludes those. them, explicitly yes. excludes them. Right. So, uh, so if you thoroughly understand the writings of Paul, and obviously this is one of the verses in verse 15 here, that can be universalized because of the way it's translated. And if okay. it's translated correctly, it's absolutely not universal. That's right. Yeah, very good. It's exclusive. Yes. Okay. That's why I wanted to discuss these last two verses in detail. Thank you, William Fink. We are making mincemeat of the universalist interpretation of the Holy Scriptures, especially the New Testament. I love this stuff. <laughs> All right? So thanks for joining me on this edition of Yahweh's Covenant People.